Ja. Thank you. My name is Achilles Anagnostopoulos, and I'm a senior software engineer at GeckoBoard. And by the end of this talk, you'll know how to use Golang to build something like this. And this is a real example of some Go code that runs inside VirtualBox in the place of your typical operating system. So the question we will try to answer with this talk is whether you can use Golang to write an operating system kernel. And let's get started with a little bit of theory around the concept of ring-based security. Now, the concept of rings uh, refers to the privilege level under which a particular block of code is executing. And your typical textbook illustration of the security model, which I'm sure you have probably seen somewhere, is a series of concentric rings. Now, the innermost ring is where your operating system kernel is executing, and code running at ring zero executes with the highest possible privilege level. And this code has unrestricted access to the CPU, memory, and any device attached to the system. On the other hand, code running on the outermost ring runs with the lowest possible privilege level. And that's where your typical everyday uh, user applications, such as your editor or your terminal, run. Whenever a user land app needs to perform a privilege operation, it needs to go through the kernel using a mechanism known as a system call. Now, for the purposes of this talk, we will focus exclusively on writing code that runs at ring zero. And let's say that we have a Go app up and running. What could possibly motivate us to want to take that application and run it at ring zero? Some types of application can uh, experience a performance boost once we port them and make them run at ring zero. An example would be an application that processes a large volume of network packets, such as a very busy HTTP server. In this case, whenever a packet arrives, the device driver will store it into a buffer or a, or a queue, which is located in kernel memory. And the kernel has to then copy this packet over to another buffer, which the user space application can access so the packet can be processed. So if you were to take this application and move it at ring zero, we could eliminate this additional copy requirement and improve the throughput of the application while also reducing its latency. Other types of applications that could benefit from such an approach would be the ones that are primarily CPU or memory bound. And in such a case, we would prefer if the application didn't have to contend with other processes on the system for access to these shared resources. The last reason has to do with the number of abstraction layers between our code and the bare metal hardware. And uh, many of you in this room today are probably using a cloud provider to host your applications. And there you're running a Linux instance, and inside that you run your uh, preferred wrapper around C groups, like for example, Docker. So in this type of stack, you will have several layers of abstraction, starting from the hypervisor layer that your cloud provider is running, and then on top of that, you have the Linux kernel and the uh, Docker system. And all of these abstraction layers incur additional overhead to the execution of your code. So if we were to run our applications at ring zero, we could eliminate some of these abstraction layers and make everything run a bit faster and smoother. So let's say that you found one of these arguments compelling enough and you want to give this idea a go. How would you go about doing this? There's been lots of interest around the concept of unikernels, and if we were to apply this concept in this particular case, what we would want to do would be to bundle our Go application with a minimal OS kernel implementation, and this could be something like an OS in a packet sort of thing written in Go, and deploy that. Furthermore, if we were explicitly targeting the cloud, we could also make this um, kernel implementation be hypervisor aware. And this would unlock some additional optimizations we can apply to make our code run even faster. So is Go the suitable tool for such a task? There has been a lot of controversy recently about whether we should start rewriting our operating system kernels in safer languages, such as Go or Rust, instead of using the good old and tried approach of using C or C++. So if you were to approach someone and mention that you were planning to build a kernel in Go, the first reaction you'd probably get out of them would be something along the lines of, Go uses a garbage collector, and you shouldn't be using a garbage collected language to write uh, real-time code, right? So while the presence of a garbage collector could prove to be a bottleneck, 
in the case of Go, the implementation of the garbage collector is quite performant compared to other languages out there. And, th and in fact, it gets a uh, speed boost with its new Go release. So this is not really something we should be worried about. One other argument has to do with the use of a runtime. And Go, as some other languages, heavily depends on the presence of a runtime to provide the language features we want to use. And the runtime itself also depends on some OS-specific functions. So someone could argue that if we were to take our code and run it at ring zero, we could effectively have to re-implement the entire Go runtime. This is a valid argument, but as we will see in the following slides, there are a couple of ways to work around this and reduce the amount of re-implementation work we need to do. So why would we actually use Go for this task? Now, the Go compiler will go into great lengths to prevent us from accidentally shooting ourselves in the foot, as we could easily do if we were writing some code in C, for example. Furthermore, we get bounce checking for our slices for free, and this is quite important because it can help mitigate the effect of any buffer overflow bugs that our code base may contain. Finally, we get to use interfaces, and interfaces are a very powerful tool when we talk about building device drivers for different types of hardware. It also allows us to implement some design patterns that make our code easier to test. And obviously, if you're writing something as complicated as an operating system kernel, you need to have solid testing in place. So as the talk time for, uh, is quite limited, we'll need to simplify our approach so we can actually build and demonstrate something. So at the end, uh, the last part of this talk will be a live coding session where we will try to actually build a simple 32-bit Hello World program, which will run at ring zero and will output something to the screen. Our target architecture will be x86, as this makes things much simpler for us. We won't use any sort of paging, so our code will directly address physical memory. And finally, we will need some minimal assembly code for the low-level initialization stuff. And since the Plan 9 assembler is a bit limited for what we are trying to achieve here, we will be using an external tool. And for this purpose, I've picked the, net, the uh, NetWide assembler uh, because I'm a bit more comfortable writing assembly using the Intel syntax. Now, we won't go through any of this assembly code in this talk, but if you want to take a peek at it, it will be posted later on GitHub together with the rest of the code that we will be working on. So, Let's talk a bit about our host machine. We are running a 64-bit OS, and this means that we have to rely on the cross-compilation capabilities offered by the Go toolchain. Once we have our kernel image ready, we will then build a bootable ISO out of it and run it using VirtualBox. As an alternative, we can also use QMU, which is very helpful if you want to debug something, or just burn it on a CD-ROM and boot it on real hardware. So, Let's say that we have our kernel image ready. How do we actually load it in memory? For this purpose, we need to use a specialized piece of software mm -hmm. called a bootloader. And since we don't want to reinvent the wheel here, we'll just use the readily available Grant Unified bootloader. Now, besides loading the kernel in memory, one other important task that the bootloader performs is to bring the machine into a particular state expected by the kernel so it can safely boot. And this could include things like setting up a particular display mode or loading an initial RAM disk to memory. Now, the question here is, how does the kernel communicate all these requirements to the bootloader if it's not yet loaded into memory? And for this particular bootloader, uh, the kernel is expected to define a special structure uh, that begins with a magic value. And the bootloader, after loading the kernel in memory, will scan the first four kilobytes of the kernel image looking for the presence of this magic signature. If it's found, it will decode the contents of the structure, apply any requested modifications to the system state, and then jump to the kernel entry point. And this brings us to our first challenge. We need to be able to control where the linker will place this particular header structure. And in order to do that, we will be relying on the GNU-LD as our linker binary, and this linker supports a feature known as a linker script that lets us control the location of each section of code or data in the resulting binary. <laughs> Unfortunately, for those of us who want to develop on a Mac, the CLang equivalent of LD does not support linker scripts. So as a workaround, we will be setting up a Vagrant box, and we will add some OS sniffing code to our make file, so when we type make on our host, it will just SSH into the Vagrant box and run make there. And this is how a linker script looks like. 
We will just briefly go through its contents and try to piece together how the kernel will look like once loaded in memory. So the first line uh, defines the entry point symbol for our code, and this will be written in assembly language. It will perform some low-level initialization functions before jumping to the actual kernel implementation, which will be written in Go. The third line specifies the physical load address where the kernel is to be loaded by the bootloader. I have selected the first megabyte as the uh, load address since some devices use the memory region below the first megabyte and therefore we don't want our code to interfere with their operation. The rest of the lines uh, specify where we want the different parts of code and data to be placed in memory. Obviously, we want the multi-boot header to be placed at the top and following that, we have the executable code section which also contains our entry point symbol and following that, we have any other data section that our code may reference. So the bootloader has actually loaded the kernel in memory and jumped to our entry point. What happens next? First of all, we don't have access to a stack. And as we all know, Go heavily relies on the presence of a stack to operate properly. So in order to run any sort of Go code, we need to provide a working stack. Secondly, when our uh, system boots for compatibility reasons, the CPU uh, support for streaming SIMD extensions, also known as SSE instructions, is currently disabled. SIMD stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data, and it's a special type of instruction that allows the CPU to perform a particular operation at multiple values concurrently. And to understand how this works, let's go through a very quick example. Let's assume that we are given a slice containing floating point values, and we want to increment each element of the slice. So the obvious way to go about doing this in Go would be to just iterate the slice and increment every element. And that's exactly the kind of code, but translated in assembly, that a naive compiler would generate. The Go compiler, however, is a bit smarter than this and will attempt to apply an optimization known as vectorization. And instead of generating code that processes one value at a time, it will emit these SSE instructions that operate on four or eight elements concurrently. So, as the Go compiler can emit this type of instructions, we must explicitly enable support for them before jumping to our Go code. Or otherwise, if the CPU encounters such an instruction, it will raise an exception and make the system crash. Finally, our CPU will be in what's known as the 32-bit protected mode. And in this mode, the size of our pointer is 32 bits long. So unless we use some CPU-specific extensions, we won't be able to address more than four gigabytes of physical memory. And speaking of memory, there are actually two ways to access it. So the first thing is using the so-called flat memory model. And in this model, we treat the memory as a linear array of bytes. And we can actually use a pointer uh, whose address would be encoded using a uint PTR type in Go to access any byte in memory. And the Go compiler will emit instructions that use this particular memory model about 99% of the time. However, there are some cases where it will use a slightly different model, and that's the so-called segmented addressing memory model. Now, in this model, access to memory is specified using a combination of something called a segment register and an offset. And when the CPU tries to resolve this address, if we try to read and write from it, it will first read the value stored in the segment register and add the specified offset to that. As we will see in the following slides, the Go compiler will generate instructions using this particular memory model each time a Go function is invoked. So whenever a Go function runs, there is a small bit of code that executes before the actual function implementation. And this bit of code is automatically injected by the Go compiler unless we explicitly instruct it not to using a compile time directive. And the purpose of this code is to implement what's known as a stack growth check. So the concept of growable stacks is what makes spawning Go routines so cheap in Go. And to understand how this works, here is a bit of pseudocode of what happens if a block of code invokes a function named foo. Um, the first thing that the stack growth check code will do is to try to obtain a pointer to uh, a runtime structure that contains information about the currently running Go routine. And the runtime uses a structure named Z for this purpose. We can see its uh, full definition inside the runtime sources, but it's quite a lengthy structure, but we are interested in two particular fields. 
So the first of, one of them is of type stack, and as you can see, it consists of two unit PTR values. As you can probably guess from its name, it's used to specify the extents of the stack that's uh, assigned to this particular Go routine. The other value that's of interest to us is one called stack guard. And what the stack growth check will do is to compare the value of the stack pointer against this guard value. Depending on the, uh, on the result of this comparison, the um, code may deduce that we have run out of stack and therefore issue a call to the Go runtime to grow the stack before actually jumping to the uh, real function implementation. Now, what's not really obvious from this pseudocode is how exactly does this code gain access to the current G structure? Keep in mind that our code may be running on a multi-core system, and therefore the Go runtime could use more than one system threads to schedule the Go routines that we spawn. So to understand how this happens, we just need to go behind the scenes and take a look at the actual assembly code that the Go compiler generates. So this is the only slide that will contain assembly code, so please bear with me. I'll try to keep everything simple. Um, so let's start with a function called foo, and what we will do is we will just invoke go build and pass the go OS and go arts values for our target architecture. Once go build completes, we'll take the resulting binary and disassemble it using uh, a tool called opt-dump, which is part of the bin utils package. And this is the listing containing the relevant stack growth check code. So the first line will try to dereference a pointer stored at offset zero of a segment <laughs> register called GS and store the result to another register called CX. The question here is, what does this pointer point to? And to answer this question, we need to refer to a very lengthy document with a title, Thread Local Storage Application Binary Interface Specification. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a long title, I know. <laughs> and uh, this specification states that this pointer should contain the address of something called the thread control block, which is a data structure that allows us to access the thread local variables associated with the currently running system thread. So the second line of our listing will perform yet another pointer dereference, only this time we are using an address located at a minus four byte offset from the address of the thread control block. So to understand why we are using a negative offset, we need to refer once again to the same specification that requires thread local variables to be laid out in memory before the thread control block for a variety of reasons, and some of them include uh, compiler optimizations and so on. But So uh, line two effectively accesses uh, one of the thread local variables for this thread, and this variable is where the Go scheduler stores the pointer to the uh, Go routine structure that is currently running on this particular system thread. The rest of the lines will um, just perform the comparison uh, between the stack pointer and the stack guard value and jump to the stack growth code if that's required. So let's take a look at what could possibly go wrong here. First of all, uh, if we don't properly initialize the segment register, then the CPU will most probably raise an exception and crash. Secondly, if we don't initialize the pointer hierarchy correctly, or we don't uh, populate the G structure correctly, then the code may assume that we have run out of stack and therefore try to call the runtime to grow the stack. And as we will see in the following slides, this is something that will make our code crash. And this is definitely something we want to avoid. So in order to be able to safely run some Go code, we first need to provide a stack. And to do this, we will allocate a 16 kilobyte block of memory in the uninitialized data section of our kernel image. And when our bootstrap code runs, we will load the stack pointer register with the address of the to the end of this block. The reason we are using the end and not the start is that in this particular architecture, the stack grows from higher to lower memory addresses. Secondly, we need to properly set up the GS segment register according to the thread local storage ABI specifications. And finally, we need to populate the G structure. Now, fortunately for us, the runtime package defines an instance of the structure called G0. So all we need to do is to make this symbol visible to our bootstrap code so we can populate the stack high and low values using our allocated memory block and also set the stack guard value to the end of the stack. And this will effectively bypass any stack growth checks and allow us to safely jump to and start executing our Go code. 
So let's talk a bit about how we actually build and link everything together. If you pass a different combination of Go OS or Go Arts environment variables than the ones used by the host, then Go Build will happily cross-compile everything for us. And this also includes the Go runtime. So as I mentioned in the first slides, we'll need to perform our own custom link step where we supply the linker script. And to do that, we need to gain access to the object files generated as part of the Go build process. So what if we could somehow intercept the list of commands that Go build executes, and before actually executing them, tweak them a bit so we can preserve the generated object files? It turns out that this is quite easy to do. We can just pass the minus n flag to Go build, and this will make it uh, meet the, the commands needed to build our target without actually executing them. And obviously, all of these modifications are something that should happen inside our make file. So we will be uh, using the Unix philosophy of stringing together different tools using pipes to automate this process. So we'll start by invoking go build, passing the minus n flag, and redirecting the standard error to the standard output. We will then pipe that output to the stream editor command, which allows us to perform a series of uh, modifications to its input. So our build script contains several commands that may fail independently of each other. And therefore, we want the build script to stop executing as soon as any of its uh, commands fails. To do that, we'll just go to the top of the build script and inject the set minus C flag. And this will actually work because we will be using the cell later on to execute this build script. While we are at the top of the file, we will also inject the Go OS and Go Arts environment variables so they can be picked up by any other command inside the same file or script. And all of these commands, they rely on the presence of another environment variable called work. And this uh, variable controls the location where the built artifacts are to be stored. Typically, this points to a temporary folder on your machine, but for our particular case, we will override that and point it to a build folder inside our workspace. And this brings us to the last bit of modification. We need to pass the invocation to the Go linker. So the first thing we need to do is we need to pass a flag called link mode with a value external. This flag will force the Go linker to delegate the final link step to the system linker. And in order to do that, it needs to convert its own internal representation of the generated object files into a format that can be consumed by the system linker. The problem here is that this happens using a temporary folder that gets deleted after the link step is complete. However, we can pass yet another flag called tempdir, and this flag will help us not only override the location of this temporary folder, but it will also force the Go linker to preserve its contents when the link step is complete. The final thing we need to do is we need to pass an additional flag to the system linker. As our code will run without the presence of an operating system, we don't need any of the runtime code or services offered by the system's libc library. And therefore, we'll pass this flag to LD to prevent it from linking against libc. And this concludes all the modifications we had to make. So all we need to do now is to pipe everything back to the cell so it can be executed. So let's talk a bit about the custom link step we need to perform. We will be using GNU LD and we will pass the object files from our assembly bootstrap code, which were produced by the NetWide assembler, and the go.o file produced by the modified build step we saw before. We'll just invoke the linker, passing our linker script, and unfortunately, we'll get an error about undefined symbols. So why did this happen? Uh, the go linker will actually flag all symbols in the go.o file as private. And this means that they are invisible to any other object file we'll try to link together. However, there is another tool from the bin utils package called obscopy, which we can use to fix this problem. And this tool will basically read our go.o file, globalize the symbol that causes problems, and write it back to the same file. And once we do this, we can run our same linker command, and we will end up with a final image for our kernel. And then we can just uh, create a bootable ISO and uh, launch it on VirtualBox. So this will take us to the last section of our talk where we'll be actually building something. Now, I mentioned that we will be outputting something to the screen, but how does this actually work if we don't have an operating system to help us out? 
Well, the, quest the answer to this question is that we will just directly write to the display memory. <laughs> Low-level stuff, right? <laughs> so we will be using the standard 80 by 25 text mode, which provides us with a fixed uh, linear frame buffer, uh, the particular physical memory address. And if we were to write the word high on the top left corner of the screen, this is how the contents of the frame buffer memory would look like. So you can see that we are using two bytes for its displayed character. The first byte uh, obviously encodes the ASCII character that gets displayed to the screen, while the second byte, also known as attribute byte, controls the foreground and background color for this character. And it's split into two four-bit nibbles, so we can pick from a palette of 16 different colors for the foreground and the background. Since we are using two bytes per character, each row of our screen will take 160 bytes of frame buffer memory. And uh, we can use this observation to target any character on the screen by calculating an offset and adding it to the frame buffer base address. So, for example, the top left character on our screen would be located at offset 0, while the top right character would be located at offset 158. And finally, the, sec the first character on the second row of our screen would be located at offset 160. So, before we actually uh, switch to the editor to do some coding, there are some limitations we need to adhere to. Unfortunately, we cannot use most of the Go Runtime features, and that includes maps, interfaces, Go routines, and calls to defer. <laughs> well, for now. So, um, the reason why we cannot use them is that all of them rely on the Go Memory Allocator, which has not yet been initialized. So, in fact, any call to the Memory Allocator will cause our code to crash. And this is exactly the reason why we didn't want the stack growth check to try to grow the stack. So, uh, when we are building our code, we need to make sure that no variable escapes to the heap, or otherwise the Go compiler will emit a call to the memory allocator, and obviously this is something we don't really want. So, let's switch to the terminal and do some live coding. To get us started, I have created a bit of scaffolding code where I have defined um, some constants about the screen and the frame buffer address. And I've also defined a byte slice which contains the characters we want to display to the top left corner of our screen. I've also defined an attribute byte which specifies a green background and black text. So, to display this uh, text to the screen, all we need to do is we need to iterate our slice bytes and for each byte, we need to calculate the correct uh, offset into the frame buffer, create a pointer to the location, and then dereference a the pointer so we can write to it. And as you can probably guess, we will be using unsafe pointer quite a lot here. So, so we'll start by creating an unsafe pointer, and then add to the frame buffer physical address the offset of the current character. And that's quite easy to calculate because we'll just take the character index and multiply it by two, since we're using two bytes per character. Now, we have an unsafe pointer, and what we want to do is we want to cast it to a uint16 pointer. And this will allow us to dereference it and use some, a little bit of uh, bit shift operations to write both the uh, attribute byte and the ASCII value using a single operation. So, we actually want to do something like um, this. Oops. This. So, if we were to run this, uh, yes, we would get something hopefully displayed to the screen. Let's see. Where? There you go. <laughs> okay. This will get better now. So. Uh, this is Go, right? And we shouldn't really be using pointers all over the place. Instead, we should be using slices. So what we actually want to do here is to overlay a slice on top of our frame buffer, and then we can actually write to it by just uh, indexing this slice. The good thing about Go is that slices are actually lightweight objects, and they are represented using a structure, which is defined in the reflect packets, and it's called slice header. And this structure contains uh, a length value, a capacity value, and a data value, which is a pointer to the actual data contained in the slice. 
So we'll follow the same approach as before, and this time we will pass a pointer to a slice header, which the compiler will allocate on our stack, so we don't cause uh, calls to the memory allocator. So we will populate the length value with uh, which is our width times our height, and also the capacity, which is also the width times the height, and finally the data will point to the physical address. So we have this pointer, and this time we will cast it into a pointer to a UN16 slice, and we can just dereference this to obtain a slice we can actually use to write the frame buffer. So uh, let's try to display something a little bit more interesting. And for this purpose, I've taken an image, passed it through an image to ANSI filter, and then encoded it into a UN16 slice, which happens to have the same dimensions as our frame buffer. So if we were to display that to the frame buffer, we could either copy it one word at a time, or we could just cheat and use the built-in copy command, which would allow us to do exactly the same thing. So let's try running this bit of code and see what happens. There you go. <laughs> we have a logo. Now, can we do a bit better? <laughs> so, we have seen that we can use slices, but what about slicing those slices? So, can we create a sub-slice without triggering a call to the memory allocator? Now, for this purpose, I have created a small transition animation, <coughs> which consists of a poor man's delay function that uses uh, two nested for loops. <laughs> and, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, because we, this is really, really low-level code. We don't have access to clock, so that's the only thing we can do. And we will just iterate the rows of our screen, and if this is an even row, we will just copy everything one byte to the left and clear the last character. And if it's an odd line, we'll just copy everything one byte to the right and clear the leftmost character. We'll add a small delay and do this thing 80 times because that's the width of our frame buffer. And what we expect to see is for our logo to slide to the edges of the screen. So let's try running this. We will just pass the same frame buffer that we used to render our logo. So let's see if that works. There you go. <laughs> This one worked as well. I'm surprised. <laughs> so let's go back to our slides. And we talked about some limitations. And obviously, in order to write a real kernel, we need to overcome these limitations. Now, the key here is that we need to bootstrap the Go memory allocator. And the good news is that the allocator is implemented entirely in Go and just depends on a few OS-specific hooks and these hooks provide uh, services that have to do with uh, physical memory allocation or virtual memory management. And this is exactly the type of service that any uh, kernel implementation should provide anyway. So if we were able to provide our own implementation and during runtime patch those OS-specific hooks to use our own implementation instead, we could bootstrap the Go memory allocator. And once we do that, we can start invoking uh, more functions from the runtime package that will help unlock more runtime features, such as support for maps, interfaces, and defer, and also allowing us to invoke the package init functions. And at this stage, we can use Go like every other high-level language to actually write our kernel. Now, the real question is whether we can actually do all of this without triggering any call to the memory allocator. And to try to answer this question, I have created a more elaborate demo. So how many of you here have heard the term ray tracing before? <laughs> OK. For those of you who haven't, it's basically a technique for rendering photorealistic graphics. And you can see it widely used in movies, games, etc. So I thought 
since we have enabled support for SSE instructions and we have the means to display something to the screen, why not build an old school text mode ray marcher? And a ray marcher is something similar to a ray tracer with a few bells and whistles on top that make it look much cooler. So I've tried to keep uh, the implementation as compact as possible so we can briefly go through it. And I tried doing that while keeping uh, Go font happy and also keeping the Go metal inter tool happy. And this is what I came up with. So you can see that the code only depends on the math package. And at the top of the file, we have our definition of our scene primitives and the location of the lights in our scene. Then you have your typical vector math uh, functions. And then we get to the meat of the Raymart implementation. And as you can see, the bulk of the code is 93 lines long. So the main function here will just render the scene and just spin the camera around. So let's take a look. Let's try running this and see how it looks. So to do that, we'll just pass the frame buffer where we are supposed to be rendering things, the dimensions of our viewport, and some vectors that control the location and the orientation of our camera. So let's try running this. And I think it will look quite nice on a big screen. But let's see. So there you have it. We have a ray marcher written in Go, running at ring zero, without <laughs> the need to make any call to the Go memory allocator. So I think this hopefully answers the question that I posted before. And with this, let's go to our last slide for today, where we revisit our initial question. Um, can you actually write an operating system kernel in Go? And the answer is yes, but it's much harder compared to other high-level languages such as C. And we must be very careful so our initial code does not trigger any sort of memory allocation. But once we manage to bootstrap the uh, Go allocator, everything becomes much easier. So the um, slides and code for this talk will be available afterwards on GitHub and also if you are interested in seeing all of this concept applied towards an actual kernel, this is a pet project of mine also on GitHub where I'm trying to build a 64-bit kernel using Go. And finally, if you are interested in working on other cool Go-related projects that don't have to do with operating systems, we are hiring. <laughs> so I think we have a bit of time left for a Q&A session, so I'll just go back to the demo. You can see it's still running. It hasn't crashed yet. Great. Um, thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes? Um, how do you feel that this could be a competition to, to Linux? Sorry. <laughs> how, how do you feel about this being the, the next big thing since Linux? Well, uh, I, wouldn't call it a, <laughs> I wouldn't call it much of a competition to Linux because like, you know, there's a huge difference in the development time uh, applied <laughs> to both projects, right? <laughs> but, I mean, there, there are some cases where you could actually use a unikernel, like such as the one I mentioned at the beginning of our slide, where it could make sense to use a system like this. But this is not something I would say that you should be using on production anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, there's one in the back. Um, how would one go about writing device drivers in Go? Okay. Uh, for this, I have to refer you to the project that I had the link at the bottom of the slide, uh, where I have actually uh, implemented some device drivers for a text console and a frame buffer based console, and also a TTI device. So you can see how it, how it works and how you can use interfaces to make sure that your drivers follow a particular design pattern. Yes, one more question here in the front. Uh, 
thanks. That was really interesting. So it seems like you put a lot of work into all of this. Uh, like, what kind of aside from like the crazy long specifications, what kind of resources did you learn uh, use to like learn about this, or was this something you you'd already had experience with? Uh, um, when you are building something like this, the debugger becomes your best friend because you have to step through so much code, especially if you take a look like, at the implementation of the memory allocator, it's like a huge amount of code. And in order to make everything work properly, you need to use lots of debugging. So you will gain lots of knowledge about the internals of the language, which is quite cool because it, you will figure out the limitations. And you know, when you have to select the proper tool for a particular task, it's good to know its limitations. Uh, in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned something about uh, people want to sort of uh, write kernels in higher languages uh, for safety and stuff. Um, this looks really interesting, but would you say that to be able to do that, would you have to, to have a lot more support from the language itself uh, to be able to write something other than C, uh, like a proper production-ready kernel, so to speak, that's not in C? Mm, um. I'm not really sure what's the correct answer to this. Uh, like, I mean, the go runtime is not that huge and it's well tested. So uh, I think it makes sense to try using it, at least to write something uh, as low level as a kernel, because you get lots of safety out of the box and it will save you from making many bugs, especially if you're dealing with buffer overflows, which can be a huge security nightmare on production systems, right? So I think there's like lots of research because the people like to use safer languages anyway. It's becoming a new trend, so. Okay, so if there are no more questions, thank you all for watching.